From We First and Goal 17 Media, welcome to Lead with We. I'm Simon Mannering, and today I'm so excited to speak with Michael Munoz, who leads diversity, equity, and inclusion within marketing at Google, and Reggie Butler, founder at Performance Paradigm, who's been advising top business leaders for nearly 30 years about how to create more deeply engaged leaders and teams. And today we're gonna to talk about some of the work they're doing together to bridge divides along the lines of race, culture, and gender, and specifically about their examined human and digital human platforms. So Michael and Reggie, welcome to Lead With We. Oh, thanks for having us. Um, I'm a fan of your work uh, because you're, you're putting good out in the world uh, and creating sustainable change, which is certainly where I am aligned with and as Michael is too. And I've been doing this for, like you said, 30 years, but part of the, the mission that people have started to realize over time is that if we make stronger connections with people, we can solve really complex issues. So thanks for having me. And, and, and Reggie, let me push on on that a little bit. So tell us, how did your journey lead you to where you are today? What work kind of trajectory were you on and, and, and what role do you play today specifically? You know, so the, let, me, um, let me start by, look, well, so Michael, remember when we first met, um, there, were, there were some things going on in the world and that Michael being the person that he is, he just sort of looked at me and went, um, we need to solve something. And like, we right. may need to be a little bit disruptive. And so if I think of the relationship I have with Google, you know, through Michael, and I've been there for a while, it all started with someone trying to solve a human-centered problem. Right. And they need different people to actually be a part of that solution. Michael, why don't you, why, why don't you tell them? Yeah, a Michael, bit about tell you. us a little bit about your background and, and specifically the role you play inside Google. That'd be great. Yeah, so um, so I'm a, I'm a diversity guy. I've been doing diversity in, in corporations like ESPN and uh, EY and Edna for about 20 years. Um, but Google was appealing to me because you know I thought it was an opportunity for us to really change the game and change the way we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, you know the opportunity to work with Reggie um, and like he says, really challenges this, challenging the status quo. Um, was was something that we were really looking forward to doing. And I was excited about doing because, you know, to tell you the truth, Simon, I was really tired of looking at data that, that said that people from different genders and races were having different experiences. And so in order to fix that, we needed to change the way that their managers and leaders were thinking about the, them in the organization yeah. and therefore the behaviors. So help me understand the process itself because you've got this 12-week very intentionally designed course that allows people to have those, you know, experiences to reflect on it, to come back. You know, what have you structured or how did you structure it in a way that it would be different? Like help us understand the, the, the pieces yeah. of that puzzle. So I'm gonna go through one part of it, Michael, you, you take them through other things. So one thing we know that in our society right now, people, the way they consume content, we had to put it in a voice that was, that they, they wouldn't reject the premise of learning something this way. So if you think of uh, any episodic feature, if you think of Netflix as a season, uh, we built it in a season format. So there's season one, season two, season three, season okay. four. Great, I mean, we've all been trained over the last year. We're That's, ready to binge watch the next uh, season, <laughs> right? That's right, and so what we did, which was beautiful, is we did it, we created, and, and still used art and all the experience, experiential things to deliver it, but we wouldn't let them fast forward. We wouldn't right. let them binge. They had to stop and they had to go do work right. in between. And Michael, you can talk about some of the just the behaviors you've seen change because of the work part, not because of the session itself. It was the work in between. It's interesting. I mean, this sounds a little bit, I don't know, like a, a saying, but it's the silence between the notes that makes the music, you know? Absolutely. It's, Absolutely. it's the, the moments of reflection. So, so Michael, what have you seen in these behavior changes? You know, you've got these well-compensated, you know, people in a very privileged environment, one might say in the Googles and Apples and Facebooks and tech world more broadly, what behavior changes have you seen as a result of this process? Yeah, uh, so first of all, uh, we took a lot of heat when we decided to gate and because people were like, I only have three hours, let me just binge through this. What's, what's been in incredible, um, and it's to Reg Reggie's team credit because they said, trust me on this, they need to, they need to spend time in the work is we have folks that are, that are emailing me, pinging me all the time saying like, it's my Friday night, you know, uh, appointment viewing now. 
And it's my it's their employment viewing because it helps them frame how they want to show up the next week, right. the next one on one differently. It gives them another tool in their in their uh, arsenal or in their quiver to be able to yeah. open up. And, and honestly, Simon, can you can you imagine this year being a manager to remote folks through everything that's going on and to be able to have this tool that helps mm-hmm. them frame Okay, this is how I want to I want to show up. This is how I want to build. We talk a lot about um, f- familiarity, comfort, and trust. Right. And that's that's you know you could argue that's easier to do in person, um, but people are learning how to navigate that mm. right now. Mm. It, you know, virtually, um, people will say to say to me, and this is the important thing when I talk about um, the results. A lot of training I've done in the past centers the the efficacy of the training on the experience of the people who have gone through the training right a lot of what we're doing is centering the efficacy of the training on the people from underrepresented groups that report into the people That's that have right. been in the training sure and so they'll call me up they'll ping me they'll say you know i'm gonna stay here a little bit longer because my relationship with my manager has gotten better i don't know what you did to them when you they went through the training, I don't know, you know, but they're showing up for me differently. I feel like I have a voice. That's I have awesome. better psychological safety. And so making sure that we're centering on the experiences of the people whose lives and careers they're impacted has really made a big difference. I mean, that's really powerful sort of social proof. And, I, you know, one of the things I, I struggle with, Michael, is like I look at the moment in time right now where we're coming out of, well, arguably – you know, COVID to some degree, but, you know, the very, the reality is that we've all been polarized. We've all been forced to stay at home. We haven't seen each other. We've been working virtually. And so in a sense, when, and if it happens that we all go back out into the world, this could be a watership moment where we reweave the social fabric inside organizations and communities all around the world with a greater sense of diversity, inclusion, and equity. That's in the plus column. In the minus column is it's almost it's hard not to experience this in any other way than punitive. Like you've been doing something wrong if you've been someone who's been privileged or benefited from, you know, the way things have been done in the past. And so they're on their back foot. So my larger question is this, how do you make sure for everyone that this experience is positive and not a chore they've got to get through or, you know, a box they've got to tick inside the company? How do you reframe it where you go, wow, at this moment in time, with the support of this course, this can be something that can unlock enormous innovation and ideation inside of the company. It can fortify the culture and build resilience. This can be a huge unlock for you personally. How do you capture that tone? Yeah. I, I um, think it's... Go ahead. No, fire away, Michael. So, fire away. Yeah, no, no. I want, but I, I, oh. I, it's part of you know, what, the, what this is all based on is that we've got to move a person from being transactional about their job and the people that help get the job done to being transformative and human centered. Right. So when people come through the train and they come out, they're more focused on their humans than they're focused on the project. Right. You still are going to focus on your project, your business. Of course you're going to do that. But right. I've had people anecdotally reach out to me and said, this is the first time I've ever thought about the people on my team by thinking about the people first and not the project or the output first. We were always going to get to the output, always. It's just yeah, we've, never all, put we've, it we've almost that. been commoditized ourselves as employees. That's right. We are a function of the projects and we've been dehumanized in a sense. Yeah. And uh, the thing that it leaves us with, and, and which is, is sort of the, the output of this, the, the meta output, is that we are trying to get people to care on their own without having to have something happen that causes them to care. So if you think of 2020, you think of COVID, you think of George Floyd, all of that, something happened that caused people to pay attention. And yet, even in that, there are still some people that aren't showing evidence that they care. Right. When you right. put somebody through an experience and you give them these levers to lean up against, like the, like the tools and the frameworks, they come out and they say, not only do I care, I realize this is a lifelong change for me, not a part-time effort. No, that, I mean, That's the point. That's, that is the point. And everything you're talking about, the reframing to be human centric, to really see each other as people first rather than employees or functions of a project it, it is so powerful. Now, I imagine when you do this work, you know, Michael, I'd love to ask you, every company is at a different point in this journey. So do you do an audit at first to see A, where the company thinks it is, 
B, where they really are. C, where are those people, the 60 people that do a workshop and, you know, where they are in their own individual journeys? How do you calibrate it so that you can meet them where they are? I, I personally, I think it's it's an incredible time to recenter who we put, you know, at the at the epicenter of what's working or not working for your organization. So for us, for so for so long, we look up at you know largely white men, and we decide, you know, we ask them, we we kind of use them as a proxy to understand how the organization is doing or on diversity, equity, and inclusion. The results, the the impact of I think Black Lives Matter and kind of Me Too movement and the the violence against Asians is that we have an ability, and I would argue like mm. the responsibility to recenter who we're putting at at the um, kind of as the arbitrator uh, arbiter of you know your organization's culture. Right. Right. Yeah. Now we can look at the black, Latinx, you know, Asian, indigenous populations and say, how are we doing at building a culture where you feel empowered, where you, where you feel a strong sense of psychological safety? At Google, we talk a lot about a sense of belonging and how do we build that? We know that there's a role that managers play in that. But yep. at the end of the day, the, the, the arbiter of whether we're doing well can't be the white men that are leading the organization, it's got to be the folks that are in the organization that are experiencing the system, that are experiencing the outcomes of the system and the interactions with their managers. So I think it's a beautiful time for an organization to recenter who, how they uh, gauge whether they're doing well or not in DEI. And I got to ask you both. I mean, you know, if we're sitting around somewhere at a pub, you know, having a drink and like, I'd say to you, you know, there's so many brands showing up and either doing public facing statements as to their commitments mm. to DINE or JEDI, these different acronyms for diversity, inclusion and, and equity. And there are those who are doing those sort of the heavy lifting internally. Is it different this time? Do you see people mm. showing up on the strength of BLM and the continued violence against people of color and multicultural backgrounds? Do you think it's going to be different this time and why? Michael, I'll start with you. Yeah. Well, first of all, I look forward to being in a pub with you or anybody. Uh, so like, let's <laughs> right? hopefully we get back there soon. Six feet apart, masks on, it's going to be great. It's all, uh, phenomenal. Um, you know, I, I think it's I think it's going to be uh, really polarized. I think you're going to have a couple organizations that really get it, have, a, have a, a few leaders that are willing to invest in the resources, understand that this is a long-term effort. We're not going to fix this in 2021 or 2022. Sure. Or, you know, maybe yeah. even in the 2020s, but you have to be willing to commit to the long term. And you've hired people to lead your organization who have the skill set and the discipline to be able to do that and shepherd your organization forward. There's another set, and mm-hmm. I don't mean this in the most positive way, but who have hired, you know, people to be their externally facing person, or they've uh, they've hired people who, you know, uh, are in sales to run, you know, who are people of color in sales or in marketing or in other parts of yeah. the thing that don't have the discipline. It's They don't treat it as a practice. They haven't hired people who have built or cultivated yeah. cultures in other organizations. And in two years, when they don't see the progress that they've hoped, hoped to see, it'll be the first job on the, cho- yeah, on sure. the chopping block sure. and the culture will, will not change. Right. So I think we're going to see, um, you know, a really a big divide, a chasm uh, show up pretty quickly. And you going back to who we center in this equation, we're going to see by uh, how people move their bodies from company to a new company, mm-hmm. how well companies are doing it. That should be the new barometer. Sure. Do you sure. keep your, do, do you, are you able to retain the talent that you have and acquire new, diverse, underrepresented talent moving forward? That's going to be the new new barometer for us. It makes a lot of sense. And, and mm. I want to come back to that in a second, the sort of the business case for it. But Reggie, what do you see out there? I mean, you get the pattern recognition of working across different organizations yeah. and having that visceral experience of their employees and their teams. Do you think this time will be different? And if so, why? Yeah, so I absolutely. So I have to believe as an aggressive optimist that it will be different. Right. So I have to believe it. But what I am seeing across um, whatever industry I'm actually in is that this time is different because they witnessed a different event in a different way. 
Right. So to witness what happened in 2020 to your own families, you were there when someone was sick and then someone died. You were there when George Floyd was murdered. Like you saw it on repeat over and over and over again. People are changing because the, their morality is staring at them, whether it's the morality at the individual level, the morality of a community. It's like things are being threatened and people, people are trying to do what every species has done for centuries is yeah. evolve and thrive. So yeah. yes, it's absolutely different. And what I think people are starting to get toward is I don't have to be uh, guilty for not trying as hard in the past, but I certainly can do more moving forward Yeah, because I can't do anything about that. I, I, you know, I'm sorry it happened or, or whatever thing you need to say about that. But there are a lot of people right now, and I'm witnessing it across every organization I'm in. There's somebody within the organization, somebody that's going, enough is enough. Yep. Like I've yep. seen it. I know what it's doing to my people. And while on my watch, it is not going to continue. And no, that's what I, 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 agree. I, I've I think, seen over and over. I, I think the universal experience that everybody's had and how it's played out so visibly and viscerally in front of people over the last year is unprecedented in some way. And I also think the younger demos coming through that really do look at life in a more inclusive way uh. without the unconscious biases are helping. And I'm, I'm very optimistic like you about it, but it's also a long-term commitment and hard work. I want to, I want to ask you, Michael, you know, um, being an older white guy myself, you know, you often probably come up against resistance at a board level and so on, whether they articulate it or not. You know, because they feel like they're being attacked or accused or they're going to get some reputational damage. So they're on the back foot. So I want to ask you, how do you address that when you've got some resistance from at a, at a board level or a CEO level? And then secondly, how do you what business case do you make for them to say, hey, listen, this is this is a value add to your organization if they are resistant. So so what do you do in that circumstance? Yeah, so I I. I I really believe that everybody has a role to play. And I think that it's not my job to determine necessarily what your role is uh, to play. I think you have that narrative already. And I'll give you an example. Um, I had a conversation with this very senior leader uh, and they said, I said, tell me about your diversity narrative. Why do you care about this? What, what does it matter to you? What does it matter to you? And he said, um, you know, hey, uh, you know, I watched this movie and, you know, I, I, I was I went to school in Michigan and it was we were super diverse. And I was like, well, I'm just going to pause you right there because it was very clunky and it was like very contrived and felt like he's giving me an answer that he thought I wanted to hear. Sure. And I said, let me just stop you here really, really quickly for a second. I noticed that you've moved three or four times across country in support of your wife's career. And she's a you know big yeah, director of a large hospital system. And I said, can I ask you, are you proud of that? And he said, I'll clean it up a little bit, but he, he said, I'm really proud of that. I'm really right. proud of that. Right. Um, and I said, then that's your narrative, right? You have an opportunity to lean in in support of, mm -hmm. you know, greater equality for women. And, you know, that's your, you don't have to do this thing that you think I need you to do. We need you there too. And right. so I spent a lot of time with, with our, our leaders trying to figure out what makes them tick, what, is, what happened in their lived experience that is going to make them show up and use their organizational capital on behalf of somebody that doesn't look like them. It's because interesting. I'm hearing a theme where it's sort of like you're shifting the center of gravity time and time again from the project yeah. to the person, from the professional to the personal, from the corporate narrative to the human narrative. So it's almost like you're kind of constantly reaching into people and organizations and turning them inside out and saying, come on, let's elevate the, the, the humanity. Would that, would that be fair? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, you asked, you asked the second part of that question is like, why should they be doing it? Right. Sure. Because, you know, the, I fundamentally believe people ask me all the time, why is diversity important? And for me, the answer is it's not. It's not important unless you've built a culture of inclusion, that you've built a culture of empowerment with strong psychological safety. Because I, I can promise you one thing, Simon. Yeah. If you have an organization that has a lot of diversity and no psychological safety, no sense of belonging, that company either has currently or will soon have a retention problem. Sure. Right? 
That's right. And so, so you need to focus on the people first. And, and when we start to do that, when we start to do it consistently, and Reggie talks about this all the time, when you start to do it when times are tough, right? It's easy to do when it's, you know, heading into holiday or vacation or whatever. But, you know, when a project deadline is, is up against and you have to make that deadline, you know, do you still care about your people? Do you still put them first? Right. And that's going to be the t telling tale of how effective these managers and leaders yeah. are in their organizations. Yeah. And I want to ask you, Reggie, something based on that. You know, it's one thing to elevate this conversation, to humanize the experience. But none of this is happening in a vacuum. It's not like we've got a clean slate and nothing but opportunity ahead of us. There are still headwinds. I mean, the rise of, well, the rising awareness of existing white supremacism mm -hmm. in the, in, in mm -hmm. the country. And, you know, it's played out quite dramatically on the political front, but there are forces working against the type of goals that we're talking about here on this conversation. So how do you contextualize that, you know, in this broader conversation? Because, you know, it's complicated and it gets very emotional very quickly for people. Help me understand. Yeah, a little, some of it has to do with, uh, I'm trying to get leaders to understand fundamentally not to be scared of the ambiguity and complexity that it takes to actually solve any of these issues relating to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Right. So we, I have a, a lot of people who sit in, in positions of power and influence that are afraid they're gonna make a mistake. Right. And, and, and because it's so public facing, they don't want that to happen. I was like, well then you're not willing to do what it takes to make progress occur. And right. every now and then I get a leader who goes, I'm not worried about the mistake because I have enough. If progress means I have to lose something so that other people can gain, then I'm going to do it. And what we're trying to push people toward is don't be paralyzed by the effort. Simon, you know what the credibility is in leadership spaces right now? Evidence of effort. Right. It's like, let me see you try. I don't care if you mess up. I care that I, whether or not I see you try. And if you're trying and it's coming from a, I want progress to occur, you get a lot of people that are having different lived experience, live, different lived experiences that are actually saying, at least I know I'm in a place with at least a leader or two that is showing me evidence of effort and that will make me stay. So yeah. I think there's, I, I also it? believe that the, the polarization that you talk about it's been there for centuries, will continue to be there. The subjects will just change. What we need people to do is get involved and stay engaged. Not right. part-time. Get involved, stay engaged. You've been through how many careers right now and you're still engaged. Sure. That's the point. I need more of you at scale that want to care about what's happening, not now, but what happens next. And that's really different. It, it, really it different. is a long-term commitment and, and how do you elevate it as a priority inside the organization? And I'm getting a little bit tactical about it. For example, a lot of brands have woken up the need to be more purposeful. And then you hear things like ESG, environmental, social and governance issues. Mm -hmm. And DI and E, diversity and inclusion, often sits within governance and social to some extent. I mean, how are you framing this work inside the business and brand priorities of organizations who are attuned to the larger conversation about capitalism, about business, about climate, about our future. H how do you approach it from a sort of strategic messaging point of view? Michael, why don't you help us there? I mean, one of the things we focus on is making sure that we, are, we, we represent our users authentically, right? And I think a lot of brands, a lot of you know, companies have missed that. They throw a brown person with brown skin and into an ad or, or they rely on stereotypes and everything like that. And yeah. I, I think, you know, we got to make sure that we are getting as proximate to folks. And by that, I mean, having folks that don't necessarily speak to the entire communities, but can give us a level of insight into communities so that we can authentically represent them in our products and tools. Right. So, so for us, that that's a, that's a kind of a, a starter for us in terms of how we're thinking about uh, you know the Google market Google marketing and what we're we're trying to do. Yeah, and I've seen it play out in a couple of other different ways, Simon. There are there are some people that when you look at scenario planning about the future of the business, one thing is always a common thread. What's the what's the healthy way for our business to prosper and be relevant and make a difference to our communities? 
And sometimes I can get a leader to say, here's the things we paid attention to. We paid attention to climate change. We paid attention to, to green initiatives. We paid attention to that. And I always look at them and go, uh, okay, what about your internal workforce and your people? Uh, have you made that a priority yet? And they all go, of course we have. And I'm going, doesn't seem to be that way. Right. Because you haven't shown not just the evidence of effort, but you haven't shown the investment at a level where there was a return that your people think that you made it a priority. Because I believe there's a lot of leaders who are making it a priority, but the messaging and the signaling that occurs is falling on deaf ears because they can't see the progress. So you have to prioritize not only the effort, but the message along with the effort to let people know we are doing something. You know, I want to ask both of you, Michael, if you're talking to an executive, they could be a founder of a small company with a relatively small staff, they could be a high growth company, or they could be a very complex enterprise. What, was the, what is the first thing you would say to them as to why they should invest in this work and how they should think about it? What is that, that, that starting point that might trigger them to go, you know, this is a necessary step I need to take? Yeah, I think that um, it's a great question. I think that one of the things that we want folks to do is put their put their people first, right? And understanding that they need to they need to empower their leaders, hold their leaders accountable um, in a way that uplifts them and and really takes them into a place where this isn't compliance training. They're doing this for, for the intrinsic value, and because mm -hmm. of that, everybody's going to ben benefit from it. Right. I believe that that right now, one of the best catalysts is that everybody wants to, most people really want to do better. Right? Yeah. They want to be a better leader. They're like grasping at straws for resources, right? But they also need to be freed up to be the human beings that they, they, they can be. And so this training, uh, you know, giving them the opportunity, giving them the frameworks, giving them the shared experiences is going to catalyze mm -hmm. and free up these teams, you talk about, you know, diversity and innovation and creativity. Imagine when everybody's working well together, that's that sweet magic sauce that is going to, you know, unlock the innovation, unlock the creativity that we've talked about for years, right? So yeah. we, we're, it, this training is really about giving them the tools to be able to do that, the shared experience and the freedom and the latitude to make some mistakes because they are yep. doing that, making, making, uh, showing evidence of effort that is oh, going to yeah. allow them the latitude to be able to, to not have that pressure to be perfect. Yeah. At all and times. I, you know, Michael, I, you know, so, so I, first of all, applaud you yourself, the human for taking on the hit to try to get something like this to happen. And Simon, the reason I say that is there are a lot of people in organizations that won't, won't take the risk. They're just paralyzed by the risk of what if it doesn't work? And it's like, no, somebody's got to take the risk um, so that something, so you can create traction and momentum. And I remember in, in, in one of the sessions, that because Rich Dialogues is a part of it, somebody came out and said, I had a conversation with somebody black on my team, and it was the first time I heard that it's because of me, their manager, that their life is different. And I never view myself as that. I'm just a normal person doing things like, no, it's because of you. Like if you right. didn't check in on me, if you didn't speak to me, and I don't mean like say hello, if you didn't notice me as, as being human, if I weren't visible to you, I would have left a long time ago because I am dealing with a trauma. My community's dealing with trauma. And what there's a bunch of workforce studies that are out there now that are supporting this, the one place people want to be able to talk about who they are and what their experience is, they want to be able to talk about it at work with those people. Sure. When you have that context and that construct set up, amazing things actually happen because you're bringing people together. Because I, believe, I believe, truly believe this for leadership capabilities. You have a, a job. You're always supposed to help others. And if you figure out what that looks like, it's going to look different to different people. But you're supposed to be bringing people together, not leaving people alone. So helping others and bringing people together, that's what your job is on any right. given day. I don't care what the business performance is. Way too many people, people spend time and they go, I need to look at my business performance. I need to make sure we're healthy. I have a healthy organization, healthy business, profitable, all the things. And I just look at them and go, when are you going to make one of your targets, one of your goals, human performance? Right. Like you look at business performance really well and man, you can... 
you can, you, who, you can interrogate that and make sure all these process improvement things are happening, but do that with the humanity that is in front of you called your workforce. I mean, and, and it's the biggest line item on your P&L. You invest in it every day. People walk in the door or they log on and log off nowadays. I mean, how can we not invest in that? And I, w I want to end in a sort of expansive note. You know, we're slowly embracing the responsibility of this conversation and behavioral change and so on. But from both of you, I'd love to hear just how far can this go? What is that promise when you really do embrace it? How much can you transform an organization? Like, Michael, you know, if you could really just cast your eye down the road and say in the spirit of aggressive optimism that Reggie mentioned, what is possible when you really do this well? You know, I, I, I <laughs> the other thing that, that Reggie and I bond on is this optimism because I, I, I don't know. And I think that's the beauty, right? We don't yeah. know what the possibilities are because we've, there's so few environments, work environments that exist that enable that creativity, that enable, enable ideas as they're thought of in people's heads who are black or brown or trans or othered in some way to get out into the world because we haven't created those, atmos those atmospheres, those environments where, you know, I can conceive of, the, of something as a, you know, uh, Puerto Rican Jewish diabetic and it gets into the world without somebody, you know, muffling it or changing it or right. scripting mm. it in some. Mm. So that's the, that's the possibility that I don't even know that we like the optimist in me doesn't know that we have a firm grasp of yet. I, I love that. We don't even know yeah. what's possible when we <laughs> deeply connect and celebrate yeah. everything each of us bring to the table. Reggie, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think what's possible is if, if I can get people to, to stop trying to uh, make seismic changes and do individual changes and everybody decided to do that, the possibilities you cannot calculate. And I view it this way. If, if I can save a life, it mattered. And I think people are trying to save like entire generations and populations knowing I can never be able to do that, but I can save one. I can save one life. And I, I and again, I'm taking this from, you know, a, a conversation that a leader had. And he said it was it was quite telling to me when I heard about saving a life in in correlation to a car accident. So Simon, think about this. If you're if you're about to get on a highway on an on ramp and you can see the traffic is slowed down and you can tell up in your view that there's a, an accident or something. What do most people do when they see that accident and you're on an on-ramp trying to go somewhere? Most people get super frustrated. It's like, oh, you know, I'm going to be late. You immediately right. make it about yourself. Immediately, I'm going to be late. The closer you get, imagine this, the closer you get, you start to notice that it's a, it's a pretty severe accident. It transitions from I'm going to be late to I hope everybody's okay. Now, let's say you get almost parallel with the accident and you see people, meaning there's someone in the accident, you can see them, the more of your humanity starts to come out. It's like, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do to be helpful? You know what the difference is between the past and you know, racial unrest and all these kind of things is that because of 2020, people were parallel with the accident and they recognized the person. And when you recognize a person, you don't just drive off, you stop. You get out and you do what you can in that moment. And this leader looked at me and went, all I'm going to do is spend my time making moments matter right. when I can. So I have, to, I have to look for it first and not be frustrated that it's taking time away from my day or my life. And actually, to Michael's point, call in to be helpful. I think it's so powerful that the possibilities, and I, I'm not using the possibilities are endless, possibilities are real but you right. have to care and you have to get involved. I think that's so powerful and, and it, it's so true, that sort of analogy you shared there. You know, this humanity is innate within us and it's just about unlocking it and, and mm -hmm. living it and bringing it to our work and to our teams. It's so powerful. You know, Google um, sponsored and funded this program, you know, Enlightened Human and Digital Human, Michael, you know, when somebody wants to go and find out more about the program and really wants to level up their teams and their organizations, you know, what should they do? Where should they go? Yeah, so they well, can... Of... Go ahead, Michael. 
No, no. Uh, I was going to say, the first thing they can do, if you want to learn more about Examine Human, they can go uh, to YouTube. Uh, we built a, uh, um, a video about the making of Examine Human, and they can learn a lot more about how it came to be, um, what exactly it is, because it's really, really hard for, <laughs> to describe it uh, yeah. to anybody until you see it. So it's about a six minute video um, to check out what Examine Human is. And uh, Reggie can talk a little bit about digital human and where we can find out more about that. And we'll yeah, include it, the link to that video in the show notes. So that's fantastic. Thank you. And Reggie, yeah, what about the, uh, you know Performance Paradigm? Where can they go to find out yeah. about the so course? You can, and how you they can go to the Performance Paradigm website. You can also find that same video. And there are other videos there that sort of talk about equity, inclusion, diversity, and leadership as, as potential solutions, especially rich dialogues, which a lot of people want to use right now to help build stronger teams and to skill people up. So you can go to my website for that. Um, the other thing is that I would suggest, and this is for everybody, I would, because the world is consuming things like you're delivering right now, Simon, podcast, there's um, so many resources out there right now of people offering really awesome solutions for how people can get involved and stay engaged. And I'm saying all of you, pay attention to podcasts. There's a ton of information that you can learn where you're doing your own pre-work versus trying to... Uh, learn about the experiences of others by burdening the others by asking them what it's like to be them. There's a whole other way to do that. So I'm, visit my website. I've got a, it's called Care More Podcast. And I, I try to do inspirational things for people to have positive messages. So there's a lot of ways to get in touch with us, um, YouTube, our website uh, and things. But I really thank you for having us and allow us to amplify our voices. Well, thank you for the, you know, the fresh thinking, the disruptive approach and the, and the true passion for this topic at a time when it's needed more than ever. So, yeah. Michael, Reggie, thank you for your time. And uh, I would encourage everybody out there to go and go and check out these programs because they make a truly transformative difference. So thank you okay. to you both. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Simon. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Lead With We. You can find out more information about Michael and Reggie and Examined Human and Digital Human in the description below. And if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and make sure you subscribe to this channel here on YouTube by clicking the red button below. Lead With We is produced by Goal17 Media, and you can also listen to each episode on Apple, Google, or Spotify. I'll see you next week. And until then, let's all lead with we.